The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was the 1943 act of Jewish resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto in German-occupied Poland during World War II to oppose Nazi Germany's final effort to transport the remaining ghetto population to Majdanek and Treblinka death camps. After the gross auction Warsaw of summer 1942, in which more than a quarter of a million Jews were deported from the ghetto to Treblinka and murdered, the remaining Jews began to build bunkers and smuggle weapons and explosives into the ghetto. The left-wing Jewish combat organization and right-wing Jewish military union formed and began to train. A small resistance effort to another roundup in January 1943 was partially successful and spurred Polish resistance groups to support the Jews in earnest. The uprising started on the 19th of April, when the ghetto refused to surrender to the police commander SS Brigade Führer Jürgen Stroop, who ordered the burning of the ghetto, block by block, ending on the 16th of May. A total of 13,000 Jews were killed, about half of them burnt alive or suffocated. German casualties were probably fewer than 150, with Stroop reporting 110 casualties. It was the largest single revolt by Jews during World War II. The Jews knew that the uprising was doomed and their survival was unlikely. Marek Edelman, the only surviving Zob commander, said their inspiration to fight was not to allow the Germans alone to pick the time and place of our deaths. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the uprising was one of the most significant occurrences in the history of the Jewish people. Chapter 1 Background In 1939, German authorities began to concentrate Poland's population of over 3 million Jews into a number of extremely crowded ghettos located in large Polish cities. The largest of these, the Warsaw Ghetto, collected approximately 300,000 to 400,000 people into a densely packed, 3.3 square kilometers, central area of Warsaw. Thousands of Jews died due to rampant disease and starvation under SS und Polizia Odilo Globochnik, and SS Standartenfuhrer Ludwig Hahn, even before the mass deportations from the ghetto to the Treblinka extermination camp began. The SS conducted many of the deportations during the operation codenamed Grossarchen Warschau, between 23 July and 21 September 1942. Just before the operation began, the German Resettlement Commissioner SS Schoenbonfora Hermann Hofel called a meeting of the Ghetto Jewish Council Judenrat and informed its leader, Adam Zaniakow, that he would require 7,000 Jews a day for the resettlement to the east. Zaniakow committed suicide once he became aware of the true goal of the resettlement plan. Approximately 254,000 ghetto residents died at Treblinka during the two-month-long operation. The gross auction was directed by SS Oberführer Ferdinand von Samenfrankenegg, the SS and police commander of the Warsaw area since 1941. He was relieved of duty by SS und Polizeiführer Jürgen Stroop, sent to Warsaw by Heinrich Himmler on 17 April 1943. Stroop took over from von Samenfrankenegg following the failure of the latter to pacify the ghetto resistance. When the deportations first began, Members of the Jewish resistance movement met, and decided not to fight the SS directives, believing that the Jews were being sent to labor camps and not to their deaths. But by the end of 1942, ghetto inhabitants learned that the deportations were part of an extermination process. Many of the remaining Jews decided to revolt. The first armed resistance in the ghetto occurred in January 1943. On the 19th of April 1943, Passover Eve, the Germans entered the ghetto. The remaining Jews knew that the Germans would murder them, and they decided to resist to the last. While the uprising was underway, the Bermuda Conference was held by the Allies from 19 to 29 April 1943 to discuss the Jewish refugee problem. Discussions included the question of Jewish refugees who had been liberated by Allied forces and those who still remained within German and occupied Europe. Chapter 2, The Uprising Chapter 2 Section 1, January Revolt On the 18th of January 1943, the Germans began their second deportation of the Jews, which led to the first instance of armed insurgency within the ghetto. 
while Jewish families hid in their so-called bunkers, fighters of the ZZW, joined by elements of the Zob, resisted, engaging the Germans in direct clashes. Though the ZZW and Zob suffered heavy losses, the Germans also took casualties, and the deportation was halted within a few days. Only 5,000 Jews were removed, instead of the 8,000 planned by Globochnik. Hundreds of people in the Warsaw Ghetto were ready to fight, adults and children, sparsely armed with handguns, gasoline bottles, and a few other weapons that had been smuggled into the ghetto by resistance fighters. Most of the Jewish fighters did not view their actions as an effective measure by which to save themselves, but rather as a battle for the honor of the Jewish people, and a protest against the world's silence. Chapter 2 Section 2 Preparations Two resistance organizations, the ZZW and Zob, took control of the ghetto. They built dozens of fighting posts and executed a number of Nazi collaborators, including Jewish ghetto police officers, members of the fake resistance organization Zagyu, as well as Gestapo and Abwehr agents. The Zob established a prison to hold and execute traitors and collaborators. Josef Serinsky, former head of the Jewish ghetto police, committed suicide. Chapter 2 Section 3 Main Revolt On the 19th of April 1943, on the eve of Passover, the police and SS auxiliary forces entered the ghetto. They were planning to complete the deportation action within three days, but were ambushed by Jewish insurgents firing and tossing Molotov cocktails and hand grenades from alleyways, sewers, and windows. The Germans suffered 59 casualties and their advance bogged down. Two of their combat vehicles were set on fire by the insurgents' petrol bombs. Following von Salmon Frankenegg's failure to contain the revolt, he lost his post as the SS and police commander of Warsaw. He was replaced by SS Brigade Fuhrer Jurgen Stroop, who rejected von Salmon Frankenegg's proposal to call in bomber aircraft from Krakow. He led a better organized and reinforced ground attack. The longest lasting defense of a position took place around the ZZW stronghold at Muranovsky Square, where the ZZW chief leader, David Morik Apfelbaum, was killed in combat. On the afternoon of 19 April, a symbolic event took place when two boys climbed up on the roof of a building on the square and raised two flags, the red and white Polish flag and the blue and white banner of the ZZW. These flags remained there, highly visible from the Warsaw streets, for four days. During this fight on the 22nd of April, SS officer Hans Diemk was killed when gunfire detonated a hand grenade he was holding. When Stroop's ultimatum to surrender was rejected by the defenders, his forces resorted to systematically burning houses block by block using flamethrowers and fire bottles, and blowing up basements and sewers. We were beaten by the flames, not the Germans, survivor Marek Edelman said in 2007, he was deputy commander of the Zob and escaped the ghetto in its last days. In 2003, he recalled, the sea of flames flooded houses and courtyards, there was no air, only black, choking smoke and heavy burning heat radiating from the red-hot walls, from the glowing stone stairs. The bunker wars lasted an entire month, during which German progress was slowed. While the battle continued inside the ghetto, Polish resistance group SAC and GL engaged the Germans between 19 and 23 April at six different locations outside the ghetto walls, firing at German sentries and positions. In one attack, three units of the AK under the command of Captain Josef Seni joined up in a failed attempt to breach the ghetto walls with explosives. Eventually, the ZZW lost all of its commanders. On the 29th of April, the remaining fighters from the organization escaped the ghetto through the Muranovsky Tunnel and relocated to the Mikhailin Forest. This event marked the end of significant fighting. At this point, organized defense collapsed. Surviving fighters and thousands of remaining Jewish civilians took cover in the sewer system, and in the many dugout hiding places hidden among the ruins of the ghetto, referred to as bunkers by Germans and Jews alike. The Germans used dogs to detect such hideouts, then usually dropped smoke bombs to force people out. 
sometimes they flooded these so-called bunkers or destroyed them with explosives. On occasions, shootouts occurred. A number of captured fighters lobbed hidden grenades or fired concealed handguns after surrendering. There were also clashes at night between small groups of insurgents and German patrols at night. On 8 May, the Germans discovered a large dugout located at Miele 18 Street, which served as Zob's main command post. Most of the organization's remaining leadership, and dozens of others committed mass suicide by ingesting cyanide, including Mordecai Janjaluix, the chief commander of Zob. His deputy Marek Edelman escaped the ghetto through the sewers with a handful of comrades two days later. On 10 May, Smolzai Gielbojm, a Bundist member of the Polish government in exile, committed suicide in London to protest the lack of action on behalf of the Jews by the Allied governments. In his farewell note, he wrote, I cannot continue to live and to be silent while the remnants of Polish Jewry, whose representative I am, are being murdered. My comrades in the Warsaw Ghetto fell with arms in their hands in the last heroic battle. I was not permitted to fall like them, together with them, but I belong with them, to their mass grave. By my death, I wish to give expression to my most profound protest against the inaction in which the world watches and permits the destruction of the Jewish people. The suppression of the uprising officially ended on 16 May 1943, when Stroop personally pushed a detonator button to demolish the great synagogue of Warsaw. Besides claiming an estimated 56,065 Jews accounted for and noting that the number of destroyed dugouts amounts to 631, in his official report dated 24 May 1943, Stroop listed the following as captured booty. Sporadic resistance continued and the last skirmish took place on 5 June 1943 between Germans and a holdout group of armed Jews without connections to the resistance organizations. Chapter 3 – Casualties 13,000 Jews were killed in the ghetto during the uprising. Of the remaining 50,000 residents, almost all were captured and shipped to the death camps of Majdanek and Treblinka. Jürgen Stroop's internal SS daily report for Friedrich Kruger, written on 16 May 1943, stated. 180 Jews, bandits and subhumans, were destroyed. The former Jewish quarter of Warsaw is no longer in existence. The large-scale action was terminated at 2015 hours by blowing up the Warsaw Synagogue, total number of Jews dealt with 56,065, including both Jews caught and Jews whose extermination can be proved, apart from eight buildings the former ghetto is completely destroyed. Only the dividing walls are left standing where no explosions were carried out. According to the casualty lists in Stroop's report, German forces suffered a total of 110 casualties, 17 dead and 93 injured, of whom 101 are listed by name, including over 60 members of the Waffen SS. These figures did not include Jewish collaborators, but did include the Trollniki men and Polish police under his command. The real number of German losses, however, may be well higher. Edelman estimated German casualties at about 300 killed and wounded. For propaganda purposes, the official announcement claimed the German casualties to be only a few wounded, while propaganda bulletins of the Polish underground state announced that hundreds of occupiers had been killed in the fighting. German daily losses of killed slash wounded and the official figures for killed or captured Jews and bandits, according to the Stroop report. According to Raoul Hilberg, the number cited by Stroop cannot be rejected out of hand, but it is likely that his list was neither complete, free of errors, nor indicative of the German losses throughout the entire period of resistance, until the absolute liquidation of Jewish life in the ghetto. All the same, the German casualty figures cited by the various Jewish sources are probably highly exaggerated. Other historians such as the French L. McLean endorse the accuracy of official German casualty figures. On the other hand, the Stroop report vastly exaggerated the actual losses of the resistance. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was the largest single revolt by Jews during World War II. Chapter 4 Aftermath After the uprising was over, 
most of the incinerated houses were razed, and the Warsaw concentration camp complex was established in their place. Thousands of people died in the camp or were executed in the ruins of the ghetto. At the same time, the SS were hunting down the remaining Jews still hiding in the ruins. On the 19th of April 1943, the first day of the most significant period of the resistance, 7,000 Jews were transported from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka extermination camp. Many purportedly developed resistance groups, and helped at the plan and execute the revolt and mass escape of 2 August 1943. From May 1943 to August 1944, executions in the ruins of the ghetto were carried out by officers of the Warsaw SD facility and the security police, under the supervision of Dr. Ludwig Hahn, whose seat was located in Schutch Avenue. Poyak staff members. K.L. Warschau staff members. SS men from the 3rd Battalion of the 23rd SS Regiment and the police, commanded by Major Otton Bundt, both open and secret executions carried out in Warsaw were repeatedly led by SS Obersturmfuhrer Norbert Berg Trips, SS Hupturmfuhrer Paul Werner and SS Obersturmfuhrer Walter Witterzek. The latter often presided over the police trio, signing mass death sentences for Polish political prisoners, which were later pronounced by the ad hoc court of the security police. In October 1943, Berkel was tried and condemned to death in absentia by the Polish resistance's special courts, and shot dead by the AK in Warsaw, a part of Operation Heads that targeted notorious SS officers. That same month, Von Salmon Frankenegg was killed by Yugoslav partisans in an ambush in Croatia. Himmler, Globochnik and Kruger all committed suicide at the end of the war in Europe in May 1945. The general government governor of Warsaw at the time of the uprising, Dr. Ludwig Fischer, was tried and executed in 1947. Stroop was captured by Americans in Germany, convicted of war crimes in two different trials, and executed by hanging in Poland in 1952, along with Warsaw Ghetto SS Administrator Franz Konrad. Stroop's aide, Eric Steitman, was exonerated for minimal involvement, he died in 2010 while under investigation for war crimes. Sturmbonfuhrer Hermann Hofel who helped carry out the July 1942 Gross Auction Warsaw committed suicide after being arrested in 1962. Walter Bellwitt, who commanded a Waffen SS battalion among Stroop forces, died on 13 October 1965. Hahn went into hiding until 1975, when he was apprehended and sentenced to life for crimes against humanity, he served eight years and died in 1986. SS Oberfuhrer Arpad Wigand who served with von Salmon Frankenberg as SS and police leader in Warsaw from 4 August 1941 to 23 April 1943 was tried for war crimes in Hamburg, Germany in 1981, and sentenced to 12.5 years in prison, died 26 July 1983. Walter Redder reportedly served in the SS Panzergrenadier Training Battalion 3, he served a jail sentence in Italy from 1951 to 1985 for war crimes committed in 1944 in Italy, and died in 1991. Joseph Bloch was tried for war crimes and executed in 1969. Heinrich Klostermeer, was tried for war crimes in 1965 and died in 1976. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943 took place over a year before the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. The ghetto had been totally destroyed by the time of the general uprising in the city, which was part of the Operation Tempest, a nationwide insurrection plan. During the Warsaw Uprising, the Polish Home Army's Battalion Zoschka was able to rescue 380 Jewish prisoners held in the concentration camp Zizhaka set up by the Germans in an area adjacent to the ruins of former ghetto. These prisoners had been brought from Auschwitz and forced to clear the remains of the ghetto. A few small groups of ghetto residents also managed to survive in the undetected bunkers and to eventually reach the Aryan side. In all, Several hundred survivors from the first uprising took part in the later uprising, joining the ranks of the Polish Home Army and the Army Ludowa. According to Samuel Krakowski from the Jewish Historical Institute, 
The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had a real influence, in encouraging the activity of the Polish underground. A number of survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, known as the Ghetto Fighters, went on to found the Kibbutz Lomeha Ghettoot, which is located north of Acre, Israel. The founding members of the kibbutz include Yitzhak Zuckerman, who represented the Zob on the Aryan side, and his wife Zivia Lubotkin, who commanded a fighting unit. In 1984, members of the kibbutz published Dafii Edut, four volumes of personal testimonies from 96 kibbutz members. The settlement features a museum, and archives dedicated to remembering the Holocaust. Yod Mordechai, a kibbutz just north of the Gaza Strip, was named after Mordecai Janulewix. In 2008, Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff Gabi Ashkenazi led a group of Israeli officials to the site of the uprising and spoke about the event's importance for IDF combat soldiers. In 1968, the 25th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Zuckerman was asked what military lessons could be learned from the uprising. He replied, I don't think there's any real need to analyze the uprising in military terms. This was a war of less than a thousand people against a mighty army and no one doubted how it was likely to turn out. This isn't a subject for study in military school. If there's a school to study the human spirit, there it should be a major subject. The important things were inherent in the force shown by Jewish youth after years of degradation, to rise up against their destroyers, and determine what death they would choose, Treblinka, or uprising. On the 7th of December 1970, West German Chancellor Willy Brandt spontaneously knelt while visiting the monument to the Ghetto Heroes Memorial in the People's Republic of Poland. At the time, the action surprised many and was the focus of controversy, but it has since been credited with helping improve relations between the NATO and Warsaw Pact countries. Many people from the United States and Israel came for the 1983 commemoration. The last surviving Jewish resistance fighter, Simcha Rotem, died in Jerusalem on the 22nd of December 2018, at age 94. Chapter 5 Opposing Forces Chapter 5 Section 1 Jewish Two Jewish underground organizations fought in the Warsaw Uprising. The left wing Zydowska Organizacja Bojowa, founded in July 1942 by Zionist Jewish youth groups within the Warsaw Ghetto, and the right wing Zydowski Zerzek Wojskoi, or Jewish Military Union, a national organization founded in 1939 by former Polish military officers of Jewish background which had strong ties to the Polish Home Army, and cells in almost every major town across Poland. However both organizations were officially incorporated into the Polish Home Army and its command structure in exchange for weapons and training. Marek Edelman, who was the only surviving uprising commander from the left-wing Zob, stated that the Zob had 220 fighters and each was armed with a handgun, grenades, and Molotov cocktails. His organization had three rifles in each area, as well as two land mines and one submachine gun. Due to its socialist leanings, the Soviets promoted the actions of Zob as the dominant or only party in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, a view often adopted by secondary sources in the West. The right wing faction ZZW, which was founded by former Polish officers, was larger, more established, and had closer ties with the Polish resistance, making it better equipped. Zimmerman describes the arms supplies for the uprising as limited but real. Specifically, Jewish fighters of the ZZW received from the Polish Home Army, two heavy machine guns, four light machine guns, 21 submachine guns, 30 rifles, 50 pistols, and over 400 grenades for the uprising. During the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, ZZW is reported to have had about 400 well-armed fighters grouped in 11 units, with four units including fighters from the Polish Home Army. Due to the ZZW's anti-socialist stand and close ties with the Polish Home Army, the Soviets suppressed publication of books and articles on ZZW after the war and downplayed its role in the uprising, in favor of the more socialist Zob. More weapons were supplied throughout the uprising, and some were captured from the Germans. Some weapons were handmade by the resistance, sometimes such weapons worked, other times they jammed repeatedly. 
Shortly before the uprising, Polish Jewish historian Emanuel Ringelblum visited a ZZW armory hidden in the basement at 7 Muranowska Street. In his notes, which form part of Onig Shabbat archives, he reported. They were armed with revolvers stuck in their belts. Different kinds of weapons were hung in the large rooms, like machine guns, rifles, revolvers of different kinds, hand grenades, bags of ammunition, German uniforms, etc., all of which were utilized to the full in the April action. While I was there, a purchase of arms was made from a former Polish army officer, amounting to a quarter of a million zloty, a sum of 50,000 zloty was paid on account. Two machine guns were bought at 40,000 zloty each, and a large amount of hand grenades and bombs. Due to the nature of the conflict and that it took place within the confines of German-guarded Warsaw Ghetto, the role of the Polish Home Army was primarily one of ancillary support, namely, the provision of arms, ammunition and training. Although the Home Army's stocks were meagre, and general provision of arms limited, the right-wing ZZW received significant quantities of armaments, including some heavy and light machine guns, submachine guns, rifles, pistols and grenades. Chapter 5 Section 2 Polish According to Marian Fuchs, the ghetto uprising would not have been possible without assistance from the Polish resistance. Before the uprising started, the most important aid from the Polish resistance to the Jewish resistance took part of weapon smuggling and delivery. Some of the earliest weapons delivered to the ghetto in mid-1942 came from the communist Gordia Ludowa group, which in August 1942 provided Jewish resistance with nine pistols and five hand grenades. Antony Krusiel, commander of the Home Army in Warsaw, ordered the entire armory of the Vola district transferred to the ghetto. In January 1943 the Home Army delivered a larger shipment 50 pistols, 50 hand grenades and several kilograms of explosives, and together with a number of smaller shipments transferred around that time a total of 70 pistols, 10 rifles, 2 hand machine guns, 1 light machine gun, as well as ammunition and over 150 kilograms of explosives. Acquisition of weapons was supported from both Jewish and Polish funds, including those of Jigorta. The Home Army also provided intelligence on German movements, connected Jewish resistance to some black market channels, and provided planning assistance for plans to defend the ghetto and safeguard the refugees. Home Army also disseminated information and appeals to help the Jews in the ghetto, both in Poland and by way of radio transmissions to the Allies, which fell largely on deaf ears. In mid-April at 4 a.m., the Germans began to liquidate the Warsaw Ghetto, closed down the remnants of the Jews with a police cordon, went inside tanks and armored cars and carried out their destructive work. We know that you help the martyred Jews as much as you can, I thank you, my countrymen, on my own and the government's behalf, I am asking you to help them in my own name and in the government, I am asking you for help and for extermination of this horrible cruelty. During the uprising, units from the Polish Home Army and the Communist Gordia Ludowa attacked German units near the ghetto walls and attempted to smuggle weapons, ammunition, supplies, and instructions into the ghetto. The command of the Home Army ordered its sabotage units, Kediu, to carry a series of actions around the walls against the German units under the code name Ghetto Action. A failed attempt to breach the ghetto walls on 19 April has been described as one of the first large-scale battles carried out by the Home Army's Warsaw Division. Between 19 and 23 April 1943, the Polish resistance engaged the Germans at six different locations outside the ghetto walls, shooting at German sentries and positions and in one case attempting to blow up a gate. Overall, Home Army conduced seven total operations in support of the uprising. Following two unsuccessful attempts to breach the wall, the other operations focused on harassing Germans and their auxiliaries, inflicting a number of casualties. A National Security Corps unit commanded by Henry Kivansky reportedly fought inside the ghetto along with ZZW and subsequently both groups retreated together to the Aryan side, however later research cast doubts on the veracity of Ivansky's claims. 
several Zob commanders and fighters also later escaped through the tunnels with assistance from the Poles and joined the Polish underground. From April 24, daily patrols against Germans near the ghetto, aimed at eliminating the Germans and training our own branches up to now without own losses. Some Germans were eliminated every day. The failure to break through German defenses limited supplies to the ghetto, which was otherwise cut off from the outside world by a German-ordered blockade. Despite Polish fighters joining the struggle, some survivors criticized Gentile Poles for not providing sufficient support, for example in her book On Both Sides of the Wall, Vlad Hamid, who was a member of the left-wing Zob, devoted a chapter to the insufficient support from the Polish resistance. The whole army faced a number of dilemmas which resulted in it providing only a limited assistance to the Jewish resistance, those include the fact that it had very limited supplies and was unable to arm its own troops, the view that any wide-scale uprising in 1943 would be premature and futile, and the difficulty to coordinate with the internally divided Jewish resistance, coupled with the pro-Soviet attitude of the Zob. Records confirm that the leftist Zob received less weaponry and support from the Polish Home Army, unlike the ZZW with whom the Home Army had close ties and ideological similarities. Chapter 5 Section 3 – German Ultimately, the efforts of the Jewish resistance fighters proved insufficient against the German occupation system. According to Hannah Kroll, the German task force dispatched, to put down the revolt and complete the deportation action numbered 2,090 men armed with a number of mine throwers and other light and medium artillery pieces, several armored vehicles, and more than 200 machine and submachine guns. Its backbone consisted of 821 Waffen SS paramilitary soldiers from five SS Panzergrenadier Reserve and Training Battalions and one SS Cavalry Reserve and Training Battalion. The other forces were drawn from the Ordnungspolizei Order Police, Warsaw personnel of the Gestapo and the Sicherheitsdienst Intelligence Service, one battalion each from two Wehrmacht Railroad Combat Engineers Regiments, a Wehrmacht Battery of Anti-Aircraft Artillery, a detachment of multinational ex-Soviet Powtroniki Manor Auxiliary Camp, guards trained by the SS Totenkopfverband at Troniki Concentration Camp, and Technical Emergency Corps. Several Gestapo jailers from the nearby political prison Poyak, led by Franz Berkel, volunteered to join the hunt for the Jews. A force of 363 officers from the Polish police of the general government was ordered by the Germans to cordon the walls of the ghetto. Warsaw Fire Department personnel were also forced to help in the operation. Jewish policemen were used in the first phase of the ghetto's liquidation and subsequently summarily executed by the Gestapo. Stroop later remarked. I had two battalions of Waffen SS, 100 army men, units of order police, and 75 to 100 security police people. The security police had been active in the Warsaw Ghetto for some time, and during this program it was their function to accompany SS units in groups of six or eight as guides and experts in ghetto matters. By his own words, Stroop reported that after he took command on 19 April 1943, the forces at his disposal totaled 31 officers and 1,262 men. Stroop's report listed ultimate forces at his disposal as 36 officers and 2,054 men. His casualty lists also include members of four other Waffen SS training and reserve units. Polish police came from the Commissariats 1st, 7th, and 8th. There is also evidence that German police of the SSBF of Lubin took part in the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto Jews, as did the I Battalion of the 17th SS Police Regiment. Chapter 6 In Popular Culture the uprising is the subject of numerous works, in multiple media, such as Alexander Ford's film Border Street, John Hersey's novel The Wall, which was filmed as a television movie in 1982, starring Eli Wallach, Leon Yeris' novel Neil 18, Jack P. Eisner's autobiography The Survivor, and Jay Vader's films A Generation, Samson, Holy Week and John Ovnett's film Uprising. The photograph of a boy surrendering outside a bunker, with Troniki with submachine guns in the background, 
became one of the best-known photographs of World War II and the Holocaust. He is said to represent all six million Jewish Holocaust victims.